So in this video, I'm going to discuss modeling linear motion um, and the differential equation that we're um, that we're going to apply uh, for this type of application is the second order differential equation that you see here. Okay? Um, so we have that y is um, is going to be our dependent variable that depends on time t. Okay? So in this case, um, for our um, for the application problem that we're going to look at for the specific problem, we're going to look at spring mass systems. Okay? So depending on, you know, depending on the type of motion that's happening, uh, we're going to end up with um, a different differential equation um, to solve. So we're going to have free, what's called free undamped motion. Okay? Basically, it's you have a mass connected to some spring. Okay? And we're assuming that this is going in a vertical direction. And so there is, so once you release that mass, then it's going to be, um, it's going to continue to oscillate back and forth. Um, so there's no external forces slowing that, that system down. Okay. So this is kind of like the unrealistic model, uh, but it's a, it's a place, it's a good place to start um, when you're starting to introduce more and more variables. So we'll look at free undamped motion, um, then free damped motion. And so this is going to, if you look at the um, system on this one, um, this is where you're going to get some oscillation, but it's going to be, there's going to be some dampening. Okay? And then um, driven motion. So the driven motion is going to be, um, for example, if you have an external, um, so let's say you have a fence post and you're using you're, you're, you know, you're using some kind of mechanism with a spring on it, and it's going to, and it's driving the fence post right into the ground. Um, so that external force, right, um, which is going to be reflected in this part of the equation, um, that is going to keep the spring um, oscillating back and forth. So this is what we call driven motion. Okay, so it's again, it's for some external force that's driving the motion or that's keeping the motion uh, from dampening. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, the, yeah. So this g of t here, uh, this is your input. This is what's called the input function. Okay. Sometimes they call that the driving function. And the solution, uh, okay, the solution to the system is um, sometimes referred to as the output or the response of the system, okay? okay the response or Sometimes they call it the um, response up or the um, output, okay, output of the system. Okay, so those are some, some terms that you may see in any kind of, um, you know, any engineering textbook um, that's using um, that's using differential equations to to model a, a a dynamical system such as this one. Okay. All right, so where do we go from here? Um, okay, so we're gonna look at the first, we're gonna look at this one, free undamped motion. That's the most simplest form that we can start with. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so over here. So let's say I have a spring, and you know there's nothing attached to it. Okay, um, so this is an unstretched spring, and then let's say over here we have. This Right, the same kind of system where this time we put a mass 
on the spring. So obviously it's going to stretch this. Right? And this is going to be, I'm going to let this be M. So that's going to be the mass that's going to pull the spring. And then over here, um, we're going to have, uh, this is a mass that's starting to be um, in, put in motion. Okay, so this is what right now what you see here, the second figure here, this is what's this is an equilibrium position. Okay. Um, as soon as we start to like, let's say we apply a force either upward or downward, then it takes that, right, it's going to start causing this to, to be in motion. Okay. So let's assume that we pull down okay, on this okay, with whatever, with whatever force that we have. Okay. All right, so with these, uh, we can start to look at uh, some of the variables involved. Okay. okay, so what we're gonna have is okay, we have the weight. Okay, the weight, all right, the weight um, is going, that's basically one of the uh, forces acting on this. The weight is going to be equal to the mass times the gravitational pull. So that's going to be M times uh, the gravitational force. Okay. And again, um, we're assuming that we're on planet Earth here. Okay. So this will be either uh, 32 feet per second squared or 9.8 meters per second squared, okay. depending on, you know, again, depending on the units that we're using here. Okay. Um, so the mass of the units uh, usually. Slugs is kind of an old um, unit for this, but it's still being used. Over, you know, still, occasionally they use this. Um, and then kilograms, and then grams, obviously. So those are some of the common units. And then you have your gravitational uh, gravitational effect. So this is going to be 32 feet per second squared, or 9.8 meters. All right, and then for the, um, if we go back and look at the equilibrium position, which is this case right here. Okay, so there's our equilibrium. Okay, uh, meaning again, if we put, you know, we, we have our mass, we just put it onto the spring and, and it's gonna, you know, it's going to uh, remain at rest. Okay, so there is no movement going on. Okay, so we say that the system is in, in equilibrium. In other words, it's in balance. Okay. All right, um, so. Okay. All right, so now, um, and again, this is the one that's in motion. All right. So um, we need to figure out the total force okay, on the spring. Uh, while we're pulling this, okay. Okay. Okay, so we have, um, obviously we have the, the weight here, okay. Mass times the gravity, uh, gravitational, uh, or mass times gravi the, uh, gravity. Um, and then we're also going to have, um, we have to have another, there's going to be another force that's related to the, um, to Hooke's law here. Okay, so 
Um, so if you take a careful look at, at Hooke's law, okay, um, it's remember Hooke's law is basically um, relating to it's basically it's the force that is directly proportionate to the amount um, that the spring has moved from the equilibrium position. Okay. Um, so if we, you know, if I, I'm going to go ahead and draw a line through here. Okay, so if you think about this, right, we have, okay, so as soon as we put the mass on here, uh, that again, that's going to stretch the spring. So there's a distance, uh, the distance between, right, uh, between this axis and this mass, we're going to let that be S. And then over here, right, we have, when we start to put it in motion, there's another distance that's affiliated with this. And we're going to call that X here. Right? And that is measured from, uh, measured from this, this part. So this is, we're going to call this X. All right, so the right, so the force, right, and this is based on Hooke's law. So there's going to be um, you're going to have two forces here, F1 and F2. So F1, again, F1 will be the mass times the gravity, and F2 is going to be um, k times uh, k times s plus x. So that is k times this distance plus this distance. Okay, and so if you add these up, that gives you the total distance from this, uh, from the original setup here. Okay, so that is again, that's just Hooke's law. Okay. All right. Um, so now, um, what we need to do? Okay, so we have our total force here. Okay, uh, but we also need to consider the, you know, the. Um, um, the you know the the direction that it's going. So since it's going downward, um, this force right here, one of these forces is going to act as an opposite. Okay. So remember, the forces act in opposite to each other. Um, so we're going to have. Um, so we're, what we're going to do here is to get the total force. It's going to be. It's going to turn out to be F one minus F two. Okay. Okay. So this. So the total force. going to be equal to m g times g minus k times s plus x. And again, that's to account for the, uh, it has to do with the conservation of force, okay, uh, that, are, that are acting here uh, on the system, okay. Um, they do talk about, if you want to do a little bit more reading on this, they do definitely talk about that in more detail in the, uh, uh, in the textbook. Uh, but I think if you've taken physics one, then you should at least know this very basic stuff here, okay. Um, uh, but again, you know, it's just, you know, basically you have a force that's counter, that's a counter against the other, you know, one and one, you know, they're countering against each other. Okay. Uh, you have one that's pulling downward, and then this one's going to be the opposite. Okay. That's affecting this one or affecting the opposite direction. Okay. So now, um, so now with that, we can go ahead and um, we can go ahead and use Newton's second law. And by the way, there is, um, we're also assuming there's no uh, retarding forces uh, on this system, uh, meaning that there's no, you know, external forces. So, that, you know, it's going to continue to oscillate. And so this is what we mean by free, uh, free motion. Okay. Let's call it free motion problem. Okay, so now we're going to go back and look at, uh, we're going to use Newton's second law. Okay. 
And uh, that's going to be basically that's the uh, the one that we're interested in is the one dimensional um, the one dimensional force rule, which says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And this is also going to be we're not factoring any of the relativistic effects. Okay, for this um, because that's going into more of the quantum physics material. Okay, um, and so keeping everything very basic at the moment. All right, so now based, so based on this, so based on this, um, we can go ahead and set up our equation, okay? Um, we know, right, so we know the force, okay, we have that here. We also know the acceleration. The acceleration, remember, is the second, it's the second order derivative, okay? And then we have the mass. So let's write that out. So we have the mass times the acceleration, which is going to be uh, we're using so we're using y okay, equals to the total force. Okay, so again, just to be just to make sure, you know, just to make sure we're clear on this, this is obviously your mass, okay? This is your acceleration, and all this is your force, okay? Which we um, which we calculated from here, okay? And again, they explain they explain a little bit more about this in the in the textbook, okay? Uh, but again, it just has to do with the opposites. Uh, one force is acting as an opposite of the other. That's all it is. And you can even reverse this around. Okay? You can, you know, you can have minus mg plus a times s plus x. Okay. Um, but we're assuming that the, we're assuming again that the gravity gravitational force is going downward. Okay. All right. So um, all right, so we have our differential equation here. Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and expand this out. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the, uh, the k variable here. Okay, so going back to what we have here and what Kind of what I what I mentioned um, earlier is that okay, we have the m mass times gravity here, and we have k times s. So that's that part of the equation. That's where we get equilibrium, right? This is what I said. When you put the mass on the spring, there is no movement happening here, right? There's there's no um, right? we don't have uh, we haven't applied the force yet. Okay, so this. Um, so this part right here in our equation is going to be zero. Okay. And so now we're left with this. And if we go ahead and set this equal to zero, okay, we end up getting this, and then we can do a little more. Uh, we can do a few more fancy things here, um, like we can put it in standard mode or standard form, I should say. So divide by or divide there each term by m. Okay, so now now what we can do here, and a lot of um, a lot of textbooks will do this uh, for a lot of applications. Um, they'll call this uh, what they'll do is they'll let this be equal to omega squared. 
until then they'll write this as if I have space here. Weird x equals to zero. Where omega is where omega squared is equal to k over m. All right. Now the reason they do that is for some other things, uh, so for some other applications. And, and, uh, um, and there's something. Uh, there is a relationship between this system and um, eigenvectors, okay, or, 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 I'm sorry, eigenvalues. Okay, so this is, this is where we, this is what we need. So this gives us free undamped motion, simple, Basically, simple harmonic motion. Okay. Um, let's see what else. The other thing I need to mention is uh, related to some of the um, notation here. Again, um, if we have, right, so if, if you're looking at your spring or your system here, um, think of this as, think of this line as x equals to zero. So anything, so anything below the axis, right? Anything below is going to be less than zero. Right? Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, bigger than zero. Anything above, okay, is going to be in this region when you're going above is going to be x less than zero. So that's very important to know. Um, so if anything's going below, right? So if your x value is, is going below this axis, okay, um, it's going to be positive, meaning that the string is stretching, okay? Um, and, and it, as soon as you, uh, let's say you go, if the spring goes in the opposite direction and if it comes above this axis, then the X value, right, will be uh, less than zero, okay? So it's very important to understand that uh, when you're interpreting these, uh, uh, the solutions to these type of systems. A lot of students, they get this mixed up um, they'll think that because it's below this axis, they think it's it's negative, uh, but it doesn't work out like that. Okay, um, so you have to. We're using this convention. Okay. All right, and so we also have some. We also have the initial conditions here. Let's see. So for our system, let's see. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm using X. Uh, I think this should be sorry. Just to be consistent. I, I want to use X. That's what I'm using here. So just to make sure that I'm consistent with the variables. Okay. It doesn't make sense to have Y and X in it. Sorry. All right. So I, over here is just a general form. So when I was writing, I was looking back over here. But this is the general form in terms of Y. Um, so it's a really the same thing. Okay. Just um, this is so again, we're working in terms of X instead of Y. All right, so now let's look at this X here. And then we have omega squared times X equals to zero. All right, um, for our initial values, okay, we have if, if X naught is bigger than zero, oh, oh hold on, to define those. Okay. 
So again, since we're in terms of X, those are the initial conditions in terms of um, X. So we have X of zero, that's gonna be X of naught. So again, when T is zero, we have X naught. And then the derivative, the, value, the derivative of X is gonna be some value. Okay, so this one, um, the first one has to do with the initial displacement. This one over here, um, that has to do with the um, initial velocity. Okay. So the, remember that the first, the, um, the derivative of the position function, which is really what this is, um, is the um, velocity. Okay. Right. And so some other important things to keep in mind here. Um, if X naught is, is bigger than zero and X one is less than zero, okay, um, that means that so X naught is bigger than zero means that the spring is starting below the X axis, the equilibrium axis. Okay. Um, and then it's going to, uh, this is an x1 is going to be um, less than zero because you're pulling down, right? Okay. And then, and then you're going to release it, which means it's going to be um, there's going to be you're, you're you're going upward, you're going upward direction. So the velocity is going to be negative. All right. Um, Mass starts below the equilibrium position. With an upward velocity. Okay, the other scenario is that if you have um, x naught is going to be less than zero, um, then x and x1, right, x1 is going to be equal to zero because in that case, so when x, so if you're above, or when x naught is less than zero, you're above the x axis. So the, so the mass, right, so you're compressing the spring, and then once you let go of it, it's going to, um, it's going to automatically um, go, you know, go, you know, go downward because of the because of the gravitational pull. Um, so whenever that happens, there is the initial velocity is zero. Okay. So mass is released above the equilibrium axis. We'll say the absolute value of that, right? Because it's in terms of a distance, okay? Since that will be negative, this just tells us how much, how many units it is, or the um, the mass is above the equilibrium axis. All right, um, so now uh, let's go ahead and solve this. Okay, this is, this is a second order um, linear differential equation. It's homogeneous, okay. Um, so getting our, um, right, so, Getting our characteristic 
equation, we're going to end up getting m squared plus omega squared equals to zero. So solving that, we're going to get m is going to be equal to plus or minus, plus or minus uh, omega i. Okay, so that was, we have complex groups here. Okay, so going back to, um, going back to section, I think if I recall 4.3, right? You have complex groups here. So beta, I'm sorry, so alpha is zero and beta is gonna be um, omega. Okay. Plus or minus. So in that case, we have x of t okay, so remember you're going to have e of uh, so basically you have e of zero times cosine omega t plus C2 e to the zero sine of omega t. And then obviously this is um, going to be X of t equals to C1 cosine omega t plus C2 sine of omega t. So basically if you, if you, you know, take a particular, um, you let omega be some value, then this is just going to be um, an oscillating wave, okay? which tells you that this spring, uh, it's not going to, uh, it's going to continue to oscillate back and forth. I mean, it's not going to slow down, right? Um, so it's just, so it's undamped, okay? So it's a free undamped system, okay? Okay, so kind of, you know, kind of a boring system, uh, but it's, it is important to start off with the foundations, especially uh, when you're working with, um, you know, if you're trying to work with physics, uh, various physics problems. Cool. So let's look at, um, so let's look at an example of this. Let's see, I'm going to, so I'm going to keep that here, um, and then I'll write the, yeah, I can do the problem here. All right, so let's say we're given, um, so for example, one. Let's say we're given a mass, right? So a mass is weighing. Let's see, two pounds. Is released. Let's see. All right. So a mass is weighing mass weighing two pounds. Stretches. It stretches a spring a half a foot. Okay. All right. And 
at t equals zero, the mass is released from two thirds foot below the equilibrium position. an upper velocity of four thirds foot per second. Okay. And this is one half this is foot. Okay. So the the thing is we need to we already have our model. Okay. Uh, we already have we already have our um, differential equation. Okay. Um, in fact, yeah. So let's let's go back to that one. So using this one right here. Okay. So there's our model that we um, just arrived. Okay. Uh, we need to figure out things here we don't have we have you know we don't have all the information yet but we can definitely use this to figure out some of those constants um so the first thing is to figure out our mass okay we need to figure out right we need to find what m is so m okay um so to find m we can go back to this definition W is equal to the mass times the gravity. Okay. Um, and so mass, right? So from here we know that mass is going to be equal to W over G. Okay. And the weight, we definitely the weight, so the weight has to do is the basically um, that is just the force we are given that um, that is given as two pounds. And then the gravitational um, force, um, since we're working with feet, it's going to be, uh, sorry, we're gonna have 32 feet per second squared. And so then when we reduce that, uh, we get one over uh, 16, okay? So this is pounds um, and this is feet per second squared. So that gives us what's called a slug, right? right. So now we need to figure out what K is, and we can do that by using Hooke's law. So remember, Hooke's law says it's the force is equal to um, the K, K is just the spring constant times the distance X. So we're given that here, okay? So a mass weighing two pounds stretches a spring one half foot. Okay, so that means this is going to be uh, two. Okay, so two is going to be equal to k times x. X is the distance, okay, one half foot. Okay, so k has to be equal to four. Four pounds per foot. Okay, so we have right, we have our we have our mass and we have our k value. All right, so we can just go ahead and plug everything in. Let's go over here. So our solution, right, we have um, one over 16. So 
1 over 16 times second order differential equals to, I can just go ahead and say plus k times x. k was 4, x equals to 0. Uh, so what we can do here is just um, go ahead and multiply standard put this in standard form by multiplying everything by or multiply through by 16. Um, so that's going to give us that should give us yeah, 64. I'll multiply through, um, multiply everything through each term by 16. Um, and then we can go ahead and solve this. So this is going to give us m squared plus 64 equals to zero. M is going to be equal to plus or minus 8i. Okay. Um, let's see. Or we can. That's one way we can do it. Um, and but then again, we have our right. So from here, uh, we could you know we could figure you know we could just plug in omega into the solution that we have. Uh, but this is fine. This will give us c one cosine. Uh, at plus c2 times sine of at. Again, we have alpha is zero here and beta is eight. Okay, so there's our general solution. Okay, um, so now we have to apply our initial conditions here. Okay, so our initial condition here is given, right, at t equals zero, the mass is released from two thirds of foot. So that's going to be x of zero equals to two thirds. And then we have, um, it's, we have the initial velocity here. So the initial velocity here will be negative. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's two thirds of foot below the equilibrium position with an upward velocity of four thirds. So that means this is gonna be X prime of zero equals two minus four thirds. And going back to what, what I was mentioned here, okay? So now we have everything, okay? Um, we can uh, go ahead and, uh, we can go ahead and solve for C1 and C2 from these initial conditions, okay? So using this one, okay? We have that uh, we're going to have C1 times cosine of zero plus C2 times sine of zero is going to be equal to two thirds. So letting T, right? So letting T be zero. And so, um, so sine of zero is just zero. And then we're left with cosine zero, which is one. So C1 is going to be equal to two thirds. Okay, now let's take the derivative because we need to use this one. So the derivative of this is going to be minus eight times C1 sine of eight T. Okay, remember that, or remembering that derivative of cosine is minus sine and the derivative of sine is cosine. So we have plus eight C2 cosine all right, so plugging in zero or letting T be zero. Okay, so we're going to get sine of zero, zero, and then we get eight times C2 here. X prime of zero is minus four thirds. So C2 is going to be minus four thirds divided by eight. Uh, that's going to give us negative one sixth. Okay. So our solution, okay, our solution is going to be okay, 
x of t equals to uh, minus, let's see, I'm sorry, two thirds cosine of eight t minus one six sine of eight t. Okay, that is our solution. That's our solution for this uh, for this problem. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Let's go to the next situation. Uh, the next scenario is for a free damped motion. Now, from here, um, we're gonna. This is going to be broken down even further. Okay. Uh, so let me write that into here. So for free damped motion, by for the yeah for the free free damped motion, we're going to have what's called an over damped system. And then we'll have a what's called a critically damped system. And then an under damped. So those are the three um, cases that we're gonna look at for, for free damped motion. Okay, so let's define what that is first. I'm gonna leave this here um, just So like I said in the beginning, um, this is uh, this first one is kind of an unrealistic situation uh, because there's no um, retarding forces at play here. Um, it's based on, you know, you're in a kind of like an, in a, you're in a vacuum, okay? Um, and then it just keeps, you know, going back and forth. Okay? So now what we're gonna do um, for our system, okay? I'm um, going back, let's see. We're going back to the equation that we had earlier. Yeah, this one. Let's see which one did I have here? Okay, this one. So going back to so we we actually derived this one just like a few minutes ago. Right? Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to consider a damping force. Okay. 
Okay? And that damping force, it's going to act on the mass. Okay? Um, and it's going to be a constant multiple of the, uh, of, of the differential operator. Okay? So that is going to look like this. And so again, that's going to be our, this is what's called a damping force. So that's acting on the mass. Okay, and this is just so this is just a constant, and then it's um, affecting the um, the velocity here. Okay, so now this is our new system that we need to look at. Okay, so we're going to set everything um, equal to zero. Again, this is for a free damped motion. Okay. okay. I should write it up here. So the second situation, okay? So free damped motion. So again, we're considering now a damping force on the act on, that's acting on that mass. Okay. So this is the um, equation that we end up getting. Okay. Um, so again, what we need to do is put everything into standard form here. So divide everything by m. Okay, and now from here, uh, we can go ahead and rewrite this. Um, we're going to call this uh, B over M or beta over M. We're going to call that two. We're going to call that uh, two times lambda. Again, it's one of those things you see in mathematics a lot of times. Um, a lot of times they'll rename the variable just for um, algebraic purposes to, to simplify things and also used in other, you know, related to it um, into other type of systems. Okay. So this is just an algebraic, uh, for now just think of this as an algebraic convenience. It's a very common thing that you see in higher level math. And this is going to be where our two times lambda, so two times lambda is equal to beta over m. And again, uh, what we can do here is we can replace this with omega squared, as we did earlier. All right. Um, so here's our reduced system. Okay. Um, so now we need to, from here we can get our characteristic equation. We have m squared plus two times lambda, m plus omega squared equals to zero. Okay. All right. So then let's go ahead and solve that. Um, all right. So we're going to have m equals to using the quadratic formula. Um, so you have A is one, B is two lambda, and then C is omega squared. So minus B uh, plus or minus the square root, uh, B squared minus four eight C. So it's gonna be four lambda. Uh, 
minus four times one times omega squared. All divided by two times one. Um, so this is going to work out. Um, this is going to give us two minus two times lambda plus or minus. We can go ahead and factor out four here. Divided by two. And then we can take out, we're going to take the square root of four, take that out. Um, so this is going to give us minus two times lambda plus or minus two times the square root of lambda minus squared. Okay. And let's see. Um, uh, B squared. This should be squared here. Um, if you caught that, good job. Okay. So that's going to be lambda squared. So this is lambda squared. Let me write that a little bit better. You see that? All right, divide by two. Okay, so this is going to give us, um, obviously the twos cancel out, so we're gonna be left with minus lambda, plus or minus the square root of lambda squared plus omega squared. Um, so this is what we need to focus on here. So depending on the values here, um, this is where we're going to get these. Um, we're going to get these three different situations. Okay. okay. So the first one is going to be um, for the overdamped system. That's going to be where we're assuming. Well, this should be minus. Uh, that's where we're going to have the discriminant. Um, is going to be uh, zero here, or I'm sorry, uh, bigger than zero. All right. So case one, over damp system. Okay, so. Let's see here. So strictly bigger than zero. Okay. Um, so that means uh, we're going to end up getting so that means right if we have two um, distinct you know values here, um, we're going to get let's say m1 and m2. We're going to get two values. So x of t is going to be equal to uh, C1e times M1 t plus C2 e M2 t. Again, M1 and M2 are coming from this, like whatever these are. You have a plus or minus here, and the discriminant here is bigger than, um, strictly bigger than zero. Um, so we can go ahead and substitute those values in here. Let me make some space there. So we're going to have minus lambda. Um, One plus okay. and then the other one plus C two E to the minus lambda plus minus square root of lambda squared minus omega squared T. Okay. Um And then we can go ahead and um, we can go ahead and break this up. 
So this is e to the minus lambda t times e to the square root of lambda squared minus omega squared plus c2 e to the minus lambda t times e to the negative square root of lambda squared minus omega squared. And then we can go ahead and factor out each one of those. Um, that's going to be e to the minus lambda t times c1 e to the square root of lambda squared minus omega squared plus c2 e to the minus square root of lambda squared minus omega squared. Okay, so that is the um, that is the simplified solution for this overdamped system. And if you graph this, if you you know pick some arbitrary lambda and omega values, you'll see that this is smooth and um, it doesn't have a um, it doesn't have an oscillation. Okay, um, it's basically going to dampen. Um, you know, it's going to probably either depending again depending on the values there, it's either going to go up and go back down, right, or go down and then up. Um, so now let's look at a critically damp system. I like that a little bit better. So critically damp system that will be when um, when the discriminant is uh, equal to zero. Okay. So when this is zero, okay. Um, so then from there we get um, we'll end up getting uh, repeating solutions. Okay. Um, so we end up getting x of t equals to C1 e to the m1t plus C2 e to the m2, let's say. Oh, sorry. C2, again, because we're dealing with, we have repeated roots, so that means we need to have another, uh, we need to have a factor of t here. Okay. Well, that's based on the second. Right, the second case that we saw in um, section 4.3. Okay, so that's where we have repeated roots. Okay, and remember, you always get you get repeated roots whenever the discriminant is equal to zero. Okay. All right, so there's our solution. Again, we can factor out e to the m1t. Okay. Um, and in this case, sorry. So in this case, M1 is just going to be uh, minus lambda. So let's, let's write it that way. Okay. So again, if this is zero, then we end up getting minus lambda. Okay. All right. And so now we can go ahead and factor out. Um, we can go ahead and factor out e to the minus lambda t. So we're going to have c1 plus c2 times t. All right, so that's over damped, uh, critically damped. And then finally, uh, we get to the under damped system. And by the way, the graph of this, if you're to pick some lambda value, it's very similar. Uh, the behavior is going to be similar to this previous one. All right, so for something that's under damped, right, so the only thing we have left is that the discriminant will be less than zero. Okay, so this will be negative. All right. okay, so that's going to be negative. So whenever that happens, we're going to end, we're going to end up getting complex solutions. 
All right, so M1, let's see. So M1 turns out to be this. Okay, uh, what we can do here, okay, this is something to explain. Uh, we can go ahead and factor out a negative here. Just so that we can get the form that they use in a lot of these uh, textbooks. If we factor out negative, then we're going to get, um, um, that should be, sorry, lambda omega squared minus lambda squared. Uh, right. Okay. So, yeah. So then this, all right, let's go in here. This can be written as minus lambda plus or minus, because of that minus, I can take that, that's like minus one. So that we can write that as an I. Okay. So this is going to be square root of omega squared minus lambda squared times I. So take the negative. So square root of minus one is going to give us an I here. Off to the side a little bit more. Okay. All right. So the reason for that is so that we can identify what alpha is and what beta is. So from here, alpha is going to be minus lambda. I'll go ahead and just identify it here. This is alpha, and this is remember beta is the imaginary part. In other words, the value in front of I or next to I. Okay. All right, so we have everything now. So it's going to be C1, E to the minus lambda T. Okay. Um, or you can write it this way. C1, you can put C1 there, cosine of square root. So cosine of the square root of omega squared minus lambda squared t plus uh, c2 times sine of square root of omega squared minus lambda squared t. Right. And this can be, um, we can rewrite this in a, in a nicer way. Um, and write this. This is an alternate form. So AE to the minus minus lambda t times sine of the square root of omega squared minus lambda squared t plus b. Now this. Um, this is something that was explained um, in, in, um, in during uh, Tuesday's lecture. Okay, so if you take if you have cosine if you have cosine sine like this um, in a term out here, you can you can write this in terms of si either all sine or all cosine, um, and that's factoring in this with this phase shift here. Okay, so this is a quite this is a more useful form because you can identify. You can easily identify what the amplitude is and also what the phase shift is. Okay. Um, so again, this is just um, so if you've seen if you've taken trig calculus or trig, then you've seen this kind of idea um, where you take expressions and write them to this point. It's you could you could see that you can look this up in any any um, trig or pre-calculus book. All right. Um, so let's see. So that brings us that, that basically we have the three forms here. Okay, so we have over damp system, critically damp system, and under damp system. All right. And this one's going to dampen very quickly compared to these other two. If you, if you take a look at, if you look at the graph of those. All right, let's look at an example here.
for those that are going to mechanical engineering, you're going to be seeing a lot more of this. Um, you know, there's a lot more forces here. Um, and not only that, everything will be in terms of vectors uh, because this, everything here is just along like in one dimension. Okay. But, um, but those ideas, you know, you can extend on these, um, you know, on this, um, on these fundamentals. So let's go ahead and do an example. Let's look at um, let's look at an example of an underdamped motion. Or let's see, well, let's start with let's look at one of these. I'll say just be there, critically damped system. So if we're given, again, so we're given a mass weighing eight pounds. Touches. Two feet. Okay, and so, um, so our, for this system, our damping force, okay, is going to be equal to two times the um, instantaneous velocity. So that's going to be by a factor of two. So I just put two there. And then we have our initial conditions. And we have our, um, so this is going to be our um, initial value. Okay, so that's our equilibrium position. And then we have our initial velocity. So when you're given the, you know, if you're given the word problem, you have to be able to identify um, those important components. Um, so definitely they'll be specified in there. Okay. Um, so now um, here's, so let's start with our model. Remember that the model that we were working with was this one. Um, let's see. All right, so let's figure out first. Um, looks like, yeah, let's figure out what K is. Know what K is, and we also need to know what M is. And that's done sim similar to the um, first example that we looked at. So to figure out K, we're going to go use Hooke's law. Um, so F is equal to K times X. Okay, so for this, we know that the mass, so we have a mass weighing eight pounds, stretches a spring two feet. So that's going to be, right, we're going to have eight equals to uh, K times two. So from there, K is going to be equal to four. Right. And then from, uh, to figure out, M, we can use this relationship between the um, between the weight and the and the mass here. So the weight again using the weight of uh, we have eight. The mass um, that's what we're trying to figure out, and the gravity since we're dealing with feet, it's going to be thirty-two uh, feet okay, per. Um, um, yeah, feet per uh, feet, uh, 
I'm sorry, per second square. All right, so solving for M, then we're going to get um, basically one fourth the slug. Again, because we're dealing with feet per square here, and um, this is this is pounds. So whenever you take pounds divided by foot per second squared, that's that's equivalent to to one slug. All right. Um, okay, so we have K, and we have you know we'll plug those back in. Let's see, so we're gonna have one fourth times dx squared d squared x d t squared plus okay beta is two we're given that so in the problem it will say like uh, the damping force will be two times the initial velocity or, or two times yeah two times the initial velocity um, or i'm sorry the, or two times the instantaneous velocity um, so that's so the factor of two is what you We have four times x. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and normalize this. Multiply everything by four. Okay. All right. So, and there should be an x here. So again, um, let's get our characters. Characteristic equations so we have m squared plus eight times m plus 16. Uh, this is going to be basically we're going to have m plus four squared. And the solution here, uh, this is going to be m equals to plus or minus four i. Actually, sorry. We have two i. Okay. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's wrong. Should be plus or minus, plus or minus um, four. I, I don't know what I think. I, uh, plus or minus four. Okay. Um, and again, I don't know why. Negative four. Okay, negative four. All right. So it's. You know, I'm doing this right now. It's it's you know late in Saturday right now, so Saturday evening. So maybe that's what it is. But anyway, it should be minus four. Okay. Um, and also keep in mind that there's a square here, so this is going to be a root with multiplicity of two. So again, that's in the beginning we kind of knew that already. Um, well. I pointed it out in the beginning that we're going to have this example. Uh, okay, but anyway, um, we have minus four with multiplicity of two. All right, so um, so that means this system is is critically damped, right? And we can go on to solve this. Uh, so we're going to let's let's see. Let's go back up here. Let's go ahead and plug that. Write the solution here. So our solution. Okay, is going to be x of t equals to, uh, I'm just going to erase this part. Let me make some space here. I'll put the initial values here. I really wish we had those boards that could slide up and down. Uh, that would save a lot of space, that would make it a little bit easier. But we'll make what we have. Thank you. Right. So x of t, um, based on this, right, it's going to be right. We're going to have e to the so we have c one e to the uh, what was lambda lambda or let's see. Yeah, minus. Am I missing something here? Yeah, C one e. Oh, okay, here. Okay, C e C one e to the minus four t plus C two times t e to the negative four t. Okay. All 
right. All right, okay, so there's our solution. Okay. So now um, what we need to do is um, we need to go ahead and um, let's go ahead and solve for our C1 and C2. So we're, we're going to go ahead and plug in zero in here. Let T be zero. So when we let T be zero, this whole term is going to be zero, right? And then we're going to be left with C1 times one equals to zero. So C1 turns out to be zero. Um, and then now let's solve for C2. We need to take, so we need to use this. So we take the derivative of our solution. So we're going to have minus four times C1 e to the negative four T minus four. Okay, so here we need to use the product rule. So we're going to have um, C2 times T, a derivative of that C2 times e to the negative four T and then minus uh, C2 minus four times C2 T e to the minus 14. So again, using the product rule here, right? Taking the derivative of the first part, uh, we get C2 times the second, and then uh, taking the derivative of the second part. So that's where we got the minus four. So minus four e times minus 4t times C2 times t. And then we can go ahead and let uh, t be zero. And again, this is all going to be zero here because we have we're letting t be zero. And we already know c1 is zero. Okay, so let me erase this part. So c1 is zero. That means this is zero. Uh, this is going to be zero. So we're going to be left with uh, we know that x, we're given that x prime of zero is equal to minus three. Um, so, so C2, right? C2 has to be minus three. Then. Okay, so our, so, our over, so our particular solution is gonna be X of T equals to minus three times T e to the minus four T. There's our, uh, there's our solution for this system. Okay, so just again, um, we solved, right? We have the uh, solving for um, our parameters. So solving for um, the, the mass, right? And the, um, the K, this, the K value, which is our string constant, we are able to formulate our, set up our differential equation. Um, and then from there, we end up with our characteristic equation. We can factor that and we get, m equal to negative four with multiplicity of two. And that tells us that we can rewrite our solution in this form. Okay, so that's the second case that we discussed at um, 4.3. And, and then we just basically back on um, solve for C1 and C2 by implementing these initial values. All right. All right, so that's how 
you can, you know, that's how these are sought. Um, so, um, so again, depending on the discriminant, you know, you, you know, if it's positive, you have, you know, real values. Okay, you have this. Um, if you have repeated roots, you have this one. And if you have complex or if the discriminant is negative, then you have this situation. Okay. Um, so, let's see. and I do have another example of one of these in my notes uh, that you can follow. Um, so let's look at driven motion now. Okay. Driven motion is going to be, um, now we're going to have a non-homogeneous equation that we need to, that we need to uh, solve. Okay. okay, so let's look at that. Okay. Um, okay, driven motion. All right, that's the third type of system for uh, uh, that we're looking at. Okay. So this time we're going to assume that there's an external force. Okay, so there's this, there's an external force. We're gonna say that's F of, we're gonna assume that force is being modeled by let's see, or we're gonna call that F of t acting on a vibrating mass on a spring. So again, you can think of um, I think in I think one of the problems in the text uh, they were they give an example of this where you have a um, you have some device uh, that's you know that's um, driving in a fence post and. You know, it's bouncing back and forth, and then it's as it does that. You know, as it as it moves, you know, it's, as it's making motion, um, it's causing the um, it's driving the fence post into the ground. Okay. Um, so that's how that's what we can uh, that's kind of way we can think about this. All right, so it's acting as an external force. Okay. So going back to the um, equation that we derived earlier. General form, right? We have d mass times the second order differential uh, plus eight times, right? Plus beta times the x dt plus k times x, okay. and then we're going to have our external force here, okay? So again, we can uh, normalize this, divide everything by M, okay? Then, so letting V over M be, that's, we're going to let that be two times lambda. And then k over m, we're going to let that be um, omega squared. And then f of t over m, that's going to be another function. We'll call that capital F. Okay. 
All right, so um, basically we, you know, we have, we end up with um, not homogeneous, you know, because we have a force here that's not, uh, obviously it's not gonna be zero. So the way to solve this is to go back to the fundamentals. Um, we're gonna solve, we're first gonna solve for the homogeneous equation. And then you're going to solve for the not homogeneous part. And that is, so this is going to rely on, again, the ideas in section 4.3. And then the non homogeneous, you can use either the trial functions or variation of parameters. So let's look at an example of this. So again, let's say we're given that a mass weighing 16 pounds stretches a spring eight to its feet. Okay, and uh, we have a damping force here. That is one half the instantaneous velocity. And a driving force. that is equal to, um, that is modeled by this function. So again, you, think, you know, that's a driving force. It's also causing some oscillation, okay? And so for this force, right, this is gonna be beta equals to one half, okay? All right, and we also have uh, initial conditions here. So x of zero is equal to two. And x prime of zero is going to be equal to zero. So this, so this part right here, um, that tells us that it's going to be, uh, the mass is going to be released. Um, right? It's above the x-axis, okay? Let's see. Um, actually, well, actually, in this problem, I think they said that. Let's see. Okay, so for this, they said that the mass is initially re released from uh, from two feet below the equilibrium. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, and it's going to have all right. So it's going to have an uh, initial velocity of zero. Okay. All right. So those are our parameters. Okay. Um, so now again, we need to figure out. Right, we have our model that we're working with. We need to figure out uh, beta. We already know we already know beta. We need to figure out k and m. All right, let's figure out, um, again, let's figure out K. Oops, I do that from Hooke's law. So our force, um, so this force is, so that's pertaining to this one. We have 16 equals to uh, K times 8 thirds. So K is going to turn out to be uh, six pounds per feet, or six pounds per foot. Uh, and then we can figure out M from this equation. So again, the weight here is going to be 16 equals to M times um, 32. So that's going to give us um, yeah, one half. So. All right, those are um, those are our uh, components. So now we can go ahead and plug them into um, go ahead and plug them into here. Okay. Let's see, I'll just go to see. Now I'll go ahead and see which one. Yeah, I'll go ahead and plug them into this one. So we're going to have, um, let's see, make sure I'm consistent here. So I'll go ahead and plug them into here. All right, so we have one half. Um, let's see, M was, M was one half, and then beta. Or no, yeah, beta was going to be one half. And then plus K was six equals to 10 times cosine three T. So some of that is just easier to plug them into back into this original form. Um, if you want to plug them, you know, if you want to do the calculation, if you want to use this one, that's fine either way. Um, so now we can go ahead and multiply everything by um, so from here we can actually yeah so we can actually go ahead and solve this so so here what I want to do and I want to write that um, we're going to solve for the homogeneous differential equation now. Okay, so that's going to um, for our characteristic equation. We're going to get one half m squared plus one half m plus six equals to zero. Or assuming the right hand side is zero and using the um, using a quadratic equation okay, we end up getting okay, so we're going to get m equals to uh, minus one half plus or minus the square root of one fourth minus four times one half um, so b squared minus four times a c Divided by two times half. Okay, so simplifying this, we end up getting one half uh, or minus one half plus or minus the uh, one half of square root of 47 pi. So this discriminant turns out to be negative. Uh, that's how we get the i here. Okay. 
So that's going to be the third. So for the homogeneous system, uh, that's going to be an under damp system. Okay. So from there, and let's, let's erase this part here. Uh, so from there, we're going to have E to the uh, X of T equals to E to the minus T over two times C1 cosine. So again, alpha, uh, this, is, this is alpha, the real part, and then this is the beta is the imaginary part. So C1 cosine of square root of 47 over two, all right, yeah, plus C2 times sine of square root of 47 over two. Uh, times T, I need the T there. Okay. There we go. All right, so there's our, um, there's our solution. Now we solve for the non-homogeneous part. So that means, um, so we could use, um, in this case, what I'm gonna do is use the, uh, uh, use the trial functions, okay? So we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna, Pick a trial function based on this. That means we're going to have to get, um, we're going to have to use sine and cosine. All right. So let's see. Okay. So we're going to use, okay, use a trial function. So we're going to set, um, we're going to say x of p equals to. Again, since we have cosine here, so we need to make sure that we include the sine part. So we're going to have a times sine of 3t. Okay. Our argument is 3t, so we need to keep that in there, uh, but we need this general form. Okay. So not too bad. Um, we're going to take, we need to take um, so to use this method, we need to figure out the, uh, we need to take these first and second derivatives. So this is going to be three times A cosine three T. And then minus three B, as we have derivative of cosine is minus sine. Okay. And then X double prime. So we're gonna have nine times so minus nine times sine of 3t, and then the derivative of this is going to be minus 9b cosine 3t, right? Um, just double check my signs here, it's good. All right, so now we're going to plug all the, we're going to plug these back into our, um, into our system. Okay. I'm going to plug that back into here. By the way, if you want to normalize this, um, you could do that. You can multiply everything by two, still get the same solution. Okay. Um, especially if you're going to use, you can also, you know, you, you can also do this part by using the um, variation parameters formula. Okay. And for that, you would you would need to um, you would definitely need to normalize or put this equation on uh, this equation into standard form. All right. So let's go through this. Um, so we're going to have we're putting all this in. Uh, one half times all this. And I'll just keep off the parentheses here, um, just save on some space. Okay, so one half times this, and then one half times this part. And then we have, um, let's see, six times the original solution, or times this. 
the general form. It's a lot, but usually things cancel out at the end. And this is all being equated to 10 times cosine 3t. All right, let's see. Here's okay, so we're gonna get minus nine halves a sine three t. So I'm gonna go ahead and distribute the one halves. Will be here. <clears throat> so minus nine half b cosine three t plus three halves a cosine three t. <clears throat> and then we have plus six times a sine three t plus six actually times. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now what we can do is uh, we can go ahead and gather up our um, gather up the sine and cosine terms. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see here. Um, just, um, let's see. We have a sine. Yeah. So we have minus nine halves a sine three t, and another. Uh, we have another one here. Um, yeah. So we can combine these two. That's going to give us three halves. Okay, so, so we can take this one and this one. That's going to give us three halves a sine three t. And then we have uh, let's see, b cosine three t. Sine. So that's going to give us, um, let's see, well, that's going to be, yeah, three halves. Cosine 3t. And then we have this one. Let's see. Yeah, these two left. Okay, uh, there's nothing better than doing math on, on a Saturday night. Okay, so, all right, so, um, so adding these two together and these two, this is what we end up getting, or this is what we have. Um, so now what we can do is factor out a, um, let's see, yeah, so both of these have a sine 3t term in it, and both of these have a cosine 3t term. So we can go ahead and factor that out. Uh, we can go ahead and write this as three halves a uh, minus three halves b plus the remaining two. We have three halves b. Minus three halves uh, a cosine three t. All right. Make sure everything's good here. Uh, three halves a. Yeah, so three halves and then three halves B minus three halves. Uh, 
that should be positive. Okay. All right. So that's three halves B. And then we have three halves A. And the other way, three halves A, three halves A minus three halves B. Okay, good. So based on, right, so based on what we have over here, right, there is no, there is no sign of three T term. So that means this, this has to be equal to zero. Okay, uh, whatever A and B are. And then over here, this is going to be equal to the coefficient in front of the cosine three T term. So this is going to be equal to 10. So we have two equations to a nose. Um, let's go let's do that over here. I'm going to erase this part. Um, let's see. I need to keep these conditions. Write them here. Okay, so going so from here we have three halves a uh, minus three halves b equals to zero, and then we have three halves b plus three halves a. So I'll just go ahead and write like this: three halves a plus three halves b. So we have a, a linear system here. Okay, this is um, this could be solved using. You know, either using um, elimination, uh, substitution, or if you want, you can use matrices. Okay, so it's already set up to where we can um, we can use elimination here uh, because we have minus three, we have minus a b. Right? This is negative three halves. This is positive. So when we add these up, um, you know, we're going to get three uh, a. So we get 3a equals to 10. So that means a has to be two thirds. And so from there, uh, we can easily solve for b. Just plug a back into either equation one or two and then solve for b. So this is going to give us five minus three times b equals to zero. Uh, we can multiply through by 10. I'm sorry, uh, by 2. So that's going to give us 10 minus 3b equals to 0. So b is going to be equal to uh, 10 thirds. Okay, so our solution, okay, based on these, so our solution is going to be. Um, this. Okay, so x of p so x of p is going to be uh, 10 thirds times sine of 3t plus 10 thirds times cosine Okay, all right. And if you want, you can factor out the 10 thirds. Okay, so that is the, um, the non homogeneous solution to the system. All right, um, so now we need to figure out, uh, we can go ahead and so to solve this. Um, so basically then you could just plug in the initial values all right, that you had over here. So you would take, uh, you would take your solution, um, evaluate zero, set it equal to two, and then take the derivative, set it equal to zero. And then from there you can solve for your unknowns. Okay. Um, so the overall solution okay, that we get, um, let's see. So we have, where was our, 
Yeah, so here. So the so the overall solution is this. Okay? So I need to erase this part. It's quite a bit here. So remember, you had the non-homogeneous solution with the um, homogeneous solution. So it's going to be E to the minus one half T times C one cosine of root forty-seven over two T of C two sine of roots forty-seven over two T okay, plus that that part. Okay, hopefully you can see this one. All right, so there's your um, so there's your solution. Okay. Um, all right. So it turns out um, again, if you you know if you if you look at my notes, I go through the details of solving for C one and C two. I don't want to you know I think that's I don't want to bore you with that. I think everybody can do that. Again, just yeah, it's just algebra, right? Um, so plug in the zero here, okay, um, and then solve for let's see our initial condition is here. So you're gonna let t be zero, set that equation equal to two, take the derivative of this, um, evaluate zero, set it equal to zero, and it turns out that this is your um, this is your so your um, particular solution is going to be this. Going to be e to the minus t over two minus four thirds cosine of root forty seven over two t minus sixty four over three root forty seven uh, sine of root forty seven over two t plus ten thirds plus this term. Okay, so if you have issues solving for this part, going from the general to the um, to the uh, particular solution, let me know. That's something I can work with you on the side. Uh, but you know, I, I think it, you know, I have confidence that everybody could do that. We've done we've done those things before. Okay. Um, so so the important thing to this, okay, um, let's give you a little bit. Let's interpret this result. Um, so if you look here, okay, you have an exponential function in front of this. So and there's a negative sign here. So if you let t be, if you let t go to infinity, okay. Um, in other words, we're going to let time go on, right, with the system. So this part right here, um, this term is going to go to zero because you have this is think of this as e to the minus x. Okay, e to the minus x right, looks like this. Actually, well, that's uh, that's e to the x. So. But if you're going right, so if you're going this way, then it's going to go to zero. But let's look at e to the minus x. It's going to be this way, right? So it depends on how you want to look at it. So if you if you want to look at the plot of e to the minus x, this is what it looks like. So it is x. Right? So okay. Um, so. As x goes to infinity, um, this is getting closer and closer to the horizontal asymptote, which in this case is zero. So, right. So as t goes to infinity here, uh, this is getting this part right here is getting it's getting bigger in the negative direction. So that means this term is going to go to zero. Okay. So this right here, this is what we call the transient term. Okay, so this part right here, this whole term is going to go to zero. 
because this one's going to zero. So that's going to cancel everything out here. So this part right here, this, right, this part of the solution, this is called the transition. That's the transient term. In other words, that's the term that goes to zero as T approaches, right? as T approaches infinity. Um, so, right, so then you're left with, basically you're left with this part. Right? That is called the steady state solution to the system. So in other words, as T, right, as T goes on, right, as T goes to infinity, um, the solution curve will start to look like this. Okay? And that's similar to what we saw before with electrical circuits. Every, um, every kind of dynamical system has a, um, has kind of a steady state solution, okay? So it's gonna settle, right? That's the solution set will settle down to some, uh, you know, to some kind of function or, or, or state, okay? So this is right. So this is just going to be. Um, this is just going to give you oscillations. Okay. All right. So I think that's about it here. Uh, so we. Um, so that's the um, example for driven motion. Okay. So um, yeah. So we looked at each of these. Okay. Um, we looked at. You know, we started looking at free undamped motion. Uh, that's where we're the most. That's the most simplest form. Um, and then we look at free damped motion where we're considering some kind of, um, you know, some kind of effect on the instantaneous um, velocity. Okay. And then based on the discriminant, based on the discriminant of our characteristic equation for this system, uh, then we get these three. Okay. And then we have the driven motion. That's where you have an external uh, force acting on the um, system. So like I said, this is just the beginning. Uh, when you go into mechanical engineering, you're going to be taking a lot, you're going to be taking a modeling class, um, and there's going to be you're going to be looking at different type of models for different type of applications. Okay, and you know these things will get more complicated uh, because there's definitely more variables involved. Um, and then for those, and a lot of times for those solutions, you have to use. Um, you have to use some software to solve the system because it gets so complicated. Um, and even some of those will be in terms of vectors. So you end up getting um, systems of solutions or systems of differential equations. Um, and if we have time, if we do have some time, I would like to talk about how to solve the, you know, how to solve a system of a, a differential system of differential equations, which means that you're not, you don't have just one differential equation. Um, you have maybe uh, more, right? So you may have n, right? Um, and, you know, n differential equations. Okay. So um, to solve that, you have to look at what you have to look. It turns out that you have to look at the um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors for that system. Okay. So um, if we do talk about this, I'll show you how to do that. Okay. How to find those, um, how to find those eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, for those that take it in your algebra, they probably already remember that, but for those who haven't taken the near algebra, that will be a good, um, that will be a good um, preview of what's to come when you take that course. So, uh, yeah, so that's about it. Um, and uh, like I said, I won't, you know, I'm not going to be here on Thursday. I'll be, uh, I'll be in Phoenix attending a conference. Um, and so, um, yeah, so hopefully go through this, you know, watch this. Hopefully we've gotten to this point in the video. Um, and then uh, you do have access to the notes on my blog, on my website. Okay. So I'll see y'all. Um, I'll see y'all on Tuesday. Bye.